Okay, it's almost the time. Uh, let's get started. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Test Seminar and a Happy New Year. Uh, okay, Master, uh, today uh, we are greatly honored to welcome a very famous uh, statistician, financial econometrician, and uh, data scientist, Professor Jian Qingfan, to give us the New Year's uh, speech. Uh, Professor Fan was my postdoc, postdoctoral supervisor. I want to express my uh, sincere thanks to Professor Fan uh, for your continued support of my career. Uh, I also want to uh, thank Professor Nishiyama at Kyoto University uh, to chair this uh, seminar. Uh, Professor Nishiyama is my uh, PhD uh, supervisor. Uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Nishiyama also. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Professor Feng Chu at Nanyang Technologi Te Technological University for kindly hosting today's seminar. And now I shall uh, hand over to Professor Nishiyama for the introduction. Okay, thank you, Jin Fan. Um, hello, everybody. Happy New Year to all of you, and welcome to TES 2022. Uh, my name is Yoshi Nishiyama from Kyoto University. I chair today's TED seminar. Uh, TES, which stands for Transdisciplinary Econometrics and Data Science, is a young seminar series started by Professor uh, Jin Feng Liu at Otto University of Commerce and his colleagues, including myself, in September last year. So we have had eight online seminars so far. So it is a great honor and a pleasure to introduce Professor Zhang Jinfan from Princeton University as the very first speaker of TES 2022. Uh, let me briefly introduce him, though it is not necessary at all, as everybody knows him very well. So uh, he works for um, the uh, Department of Operations Research and Financial Engineering of Princeton University, and he also has had a number of affiliations all over the world. So everybody agrees that he is no doubt one of the most active and influential statisticians or data scientists in the world. He has a wide range of research interests and his website says that his research interests are statistical theory and methods in data science, statistical machine learning, finance, economics, computational biology, biostatistics with particular skills on high dimensional statistics, non-parametric modeling, longitudinal and functional data analysis, non-linear survival analysis, time series, wavelets, among others. So it means that almost all the important fields and issues of modern statistics are his research target. So needless to say, uh, he has published a vast number of original papers um, in top academic journals. So also in terms of education, uh, he has mentored as many as 48 PhD students up to now, according to his website. I just saw that uh, yesterday, and that was really, really astonishing because 48 PhD students is almost impossible for all, all for anybody in the academic field. So he has made tremendous contributions to the academic society of statistical theory, econometrics, biostatistics both in conducting original research and fostering young researchers. So in fact, I, well, we were just talking uh, a few minutes ago, uh, we once invited Jan Chin to Kyoto University for a seminar. It was 2006 and 15 years have passed since then. At that time, we met him in person, of course, face to face, but this time we meet online thanks to the uh, online meeting technology. Uh, this enables us to get together and exchange our thoughts and opinions much easier than before. Uh, it is really nice, but next time I hope uh, I'd like to invite you to Kyoto and meet in person. So um, there's no point in my talking long, so let's start the seminar. Uh, his talk is entitled as Understanding Deep Q Learning. So Jan Chin, could you please start? Okay, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Nishiyama. Your speech remind me, I mean, great time that I had uh, 15 years ago uh, in your place, and that was one of the lengthy 
time I spent in uh, and there, and I have been wished that I have gone there for many years, but uh, you know, never been able to. I know that uh, Qing Fu has invited me a couple of times in 2015. I nearly go there, but last minute I have to cancel uh, due to you no know, sickness. But anyway, uh, so it's my really great pleasure uh, to give a talk today. So it's a New Year's talk. So let me say Happy New Year. So I wish that uh, you no. Know, uh, I mean, I wish that uh, we can meet in person and discuss, uh, I mean, all, on all those issues uh, in person. I think uh, just as Professor Nishiyama said, right, so, uh, yeah, I really indeed have very fortunate to have an outstanding group of students over years. And they really keep pushing my research forwards uh, and so on. So there's no exception for today's talk. It will be based on uh, joint work with Zhao Rang Yang, who is currently my student and going to Yale University soon. Uh, Zhao Rang Wang, who was a few years ago a student here at Princeton and Yu Chen Xie is his own uh, student. So this is how generation I mean, was built, right? So uh, here is the outline of my talk. So first I'll give you an introduction to give the backgrounds. Now, since not everybody is in the world of, let's say, uh, deep reinforcement learning, so I'll introduce the basic uh, pieces. What is the background of Q learning? Right? And then I mean, using more statistic econometric language to understand to uh, all of us. And then I'll see what are the advantages of a deep neural network in uh, statistical regression. Uh, and then finally, I combine those together, uh, the problem of deep Q learning. And uh, if time permits, uh, we'll extend the result further uh, to like a two agent zero sum game, which is the closest to economics, uh, at least in today's uh, talk. And uh, Professor uh, Nishiyama is correct. I mean, at Princeton, I do associate deeply with, um, I mean, with economic department, finance, computer science, uh, double E, and so on. So, uh, yeah, so I think it's appropriate time to you know, talk about deep Q learning. So let me talk about the introduction. So the uh, interface between uh, statistic and optimal decision has uh, achieved tremendous success over the last decades. Right? So breakthrough examples, including like a human level skills, like uh, games, uh, like Atari, uh, Go, right? um, I mean, spacecraft, tax holdings, and so on, or in control area, like robust hands, uh, free management, automatic driving, in interact, like a recommendation system, personalized medicine, uh, right uh, sharing, right, and exploration like uh, uh, 3D sims, navigation systems, uh, maze, and so on. So uh, what um, natural people may naturally ask, what make these amazing uh, successes, aside from the modern, you know, uh, computing power and big data, uh, certainly they is the representation power of um, I mean, deep neural networks that representation all those images, right, in terms of a few machine learned features, right, plus the reinforcement learning, which uh, dynamically, uh, I mean, collect data and uh, learn about the unknown nature of the system and then make the optimal decision. So, uh, uh, and uh, you know, these really, I mean, uh, I mean, the combination of statistical learning that actually learn about unknown nature, plus the, I mean, optimization, dynamic optimization framework of uh, reinforcement learning uh, that make, you know, I mean, tremendous successes in like uh, personalized treatment in medicine, economics, and so on. So clearly, I mean, statistics and policy making uh, well, I mean, from the foundation of, I mean, modern breakthrough in learning and decision. Uh, and of course, learning and decision doesn't mean there's no, um, no challenges, right? So for example, AlphaGo, in order to you know, train 29 millions of cell play game, you know, you need 40 days of training on the supercomputer that you and I don't have, right? And the Alpha Star, I mean, take 200 years of real time uh, StarCraft play. And this really, for the game, that kind of experience, it takes 44 days to train. 
and uh, similar to Rub uh, Rubik uh, Cube. If you want to simulate 10 years of experience of playing, it takes 10 days of training uh, under all those uh, super uh, cluster computers. And in addition, just like, uh, I mean, the deep learning, uh, the understanding algorithmic and the statistical properties of reinforcement learning is still a uh, lag behind. And today I was hoping that I can contribute something to these areas. And when we understand the problem better, so we will certainly design better and more reliable algorithms uh, for this uh, kind of learning, collecting data, active learning and uh, decision making. Uh, and uh, certainly there are a lot number of challenges to single agent uh, reinforcement learning in which you really have only one players. So uh, like a nonlinear function approximation of value functions, non-convexity issues uh, of policy data collection and uh, when to do exploration and exploitation and so on. And then computationally certainly there's convergence uh, issues and the global optimality issues. Uh, statistical or call it where it, what is the statistical efficiency, where are the best way to collect data. Right? Uh, so there are num numerous uh, you know, empirical successes and uh, particularly the paper in 2015 uh, published in Nature make a huge splash. I will uh, cover a few moments uh, later. And there are limited theoretical understanding on, uh, on this kind of issues. And uh, if you have really multi-agent uh, reinforcement learning, well, then the problem getting more, I mean, complicated, like a non-stationary environment, partial observations, uh, scalability, uh, scalability, policy, robustness issues, and there are limited successes as well as limited theoretical understanding. Uh, and uh, even the theory for two player zero sum stock hack game is limited uh, with limited understanding. And I hope in today I will contribute, if time permits, a little bit to uh, understanding of how difficult the challenge of these kind of issues. So, what is the goal of this talk? It's very simple, right? Theoretical understanding the sampling efficiency of uh, deep Q learning. Uh, I mean, uh, in reinforcement learning as well as zero sum. Uh, stock at games. And then of course the Bible book of reinforcement learning is uh, given here, right? So, uh, and uh, by uh, Richard Sutton and Bartle, right? So, and then this is the uh, deep learning and I'm just shameless uh, putting any statistical learning really be enable to you to bridge, I mean, the learning and the decision. Right? So I put in the book during the pandemic that we finished on the foundation of data science here as just one the book if you really want to learn, uh, I mean, learning beyond just uh, deep learning. So let me begin with uh, background. Right? So the knockout decision uh, processes uh, and the Q learning. So uh, what, what is the real reinforcement learning or what is the ma uh, mathematical background on decision and the learning, right? So let me begin with just imagine that we are playing a very simple single agent game, right? So you see the current environment, you see the current game, right? So you take an action, and once you take an action, so what we are going to, you're going to collect in some rewards, right? And then of course the system changed to a new sim S1. And now you see this S1, and then you take an action and you got the reward uh, or one, right? And so on, right? So the action is not taking a random. If you are taking a random, it's a policy, right? So it's not necessarily as random, is governed by some kind of policy, given current environment, what kind of stochastic action that I will make. For those people who know the digital hypothesis, testing is like a randomized testing, but it could be a deterministic rule. Once I see this thing, I take what kind of rule, right? So in the talk here, apparently, uh, there was there was a state space which talking about the environment uh, evolution. There's an action space, uh, the decision that we take, right, and then a policy uh, which is really something that we control is whenever you see uh, right a current state, you take an, an an action according to that policy. You draw an action according to that randomized policy, and. Uh, uh, yeah, and then of course the uh, this this is something that you control, right? That's our design is trying to optimize the policy to make us more skillful, and then of course uh, there is uh, unknown, uh, right? I mean transition kernel tell you given the current uh, state and the current action, what is the next 
uh, and the state uh, transition, right? And this is unknown that we need to learn, right? Uh, and then the reward typically is unknown that we need to learn too, right? So this is really uh, the Markov decision process that in this process, there's, I mean, we only learn from the experience. There's no, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, we only play and learn what it is. Right? So here's just one example of the game, right? So the current state could be a computer screen. It looks like this, right? And then you take an action, maybe moving this left, right, jump, duck, right? So this would be uh, the control that you are doing. This is one of those actions. And then the reward you may get through the playing, you get the mushrooms, coins, or fire, whatever, right? And then once you are taking action, this, I mean, right, this scenery would change to a new game, right? So this game evolution. So in the whole process here, there's only one thing that we control, right? That is when you see a screen like this, what the action you make. So in other words, the action given the current state, right? So that, uh, that, that is something that we, uh, we make. So let me just summarize again. Uh, what we need to learn, what we need to act, right? So the transition kernel uh, is certainly govern how the state evolution, what is the game, right? So this is, we need to learn. And there's a curse of dimensionality. That's why we uh, appears to, uh, I mean, uh, deep learning. And then the reward rules, right? So it's all from the past data. We can also get a, an idea. What is the reward given current state and actions? And then the, uh, the policy function is what we want to optimize uh, based on the past experience. And then, of course, the uh, yeah, as I said, uh, the transition density and the reward function is governed by the nature. And then the pi is our own control. And the only thing that we learn is from experience and the rewards. Right, the same way with my own, uh, well, I mean, my own husky. So whenever what he really learned is from the reward. Right? Now the question is, uh, how do we learn uh, this reward? So again, our out ultimate plot product is this, is to find an optimal pie that control the system, that optimize the decision and learning. Uh, again, this is the, right, I mean, the remind us the system again, and the, we define what's so-called action value function. So given the current state, plus given the current action, uh, so what is the remaining value in this infinity uh, horizon uh, macro decision process? So, uh, so this is called Q function. So Q function is, there's a discount factor gamma, right? So this is a discount factor gamma. And then this is the future reward RT. So uh, it, every time, if my action is taken according to this policy pi, right? So it, whenever I see a state, I take, a, I take an action pi, right? So uh, that's, uh, that would be the call the, uh, I mean, value, uh, uh, value function. So the, our total, our ultimate goal is to optimize the expected, right? Uh, I mean, discount rewards and uh, given the initial states. Now here, I just given a not one more time, given the uh, action uh, A0, right? So this is the, uh, the reward function that we are uh, interested in. And then of course, this reward is equal to the current reward is already given to you, right? Because it, uh, given the state and action is equal to current reward. And then there's now the, now the, the, the game ev evolved to here. So, so now is the, the next one that will be a gamma here because it's down to power T, right? And then the, uh, the reward from the remaining of the game. And this kind of equation is call, uh, being called Bellman equation. It's very simple, just like uh, uh, this is the summation is equal to the first term plus the remaining term, basically uh, like this. Right? So, but this is important. It's a very simple Bellman equation, but very important for us to find the, uh, the policy. So, the, so our goal is to find the optimal policy pi star, which basically saying, whenever I see a state, what is the optimal action I want, right? So that the reward, I mean, uh, the reward is optimized. The total reward is optimized. And uh, of course, when you evaluate uh, uh, your Q function, the action value function at this optimal policy, this is called optimal uh, Q function. Okay, so this is uh, the, the basic of Markov decision process. So now how do we optimize it? It's indeed it's very simple. I know it's a lot of notation making people uh, confused, but it's very simple, right? So from here, uh, you can see if we go back to, uh, 
one slide here. So what is the upper bound of, uh, what is the uh, upper bound of this, right? So the upper bound of this is for a given uh, S is you have the optimal action is taking what's so-called greedy policy, right? So maximize with respect to A. So in other words, this reward function is always upper bounded by, if I might place this A prime by its maximum, right? So, so therefore I define uh, also called the Bellman uh, optimality, uh, I mean, operator, which is equal to the current reward plus the upper bound of this by replacing the A prime by its optimal values. Right? So this is really what I'm defined here. And then this is as an operator on the Q value function. It's very easy to show that uh, uh, the, it, it is a contraction. Uh, by uh, and then by uh, fixed point theory, starting from any initial values. So if you are just keep iterating uh, this way, uh, then the I mean the algorithm will converge and converge to the optimal uh, value Q star. And once you get in this optimal value Q star, uh, then well, I mean, then what is the optimal pi star? Pi star is just a greedy policy. So in other words, when you see a state, let's say it's here, what is the optimal reward is nine, right? When you see a state here, what is the re uh, optimal reward action is six is optimal, right? So when you see a state, the optimal is here. So this is called greedy uh, greedy uh, policy. So, uh, so in other words, uh, from here, I mean, the problem is completely solved. It's very simple, really. Indeed, if you and I were sitting together in five minutes, I could really convince you this is the optimal solution. So now where is the learning, right? So throughout this discussion, I'm talking about population version using econometric or statistical jargon, right? Because so in other words, if I know uh, the transition kernel, right? So if I know the transition kernel uh, so that I can compute the conditional expectation, I know the reward function. Well, everything I say here is correct, right? There is, uh, there is, there is no learning here. Now, in the reality, I do not know the transition kernel. Transition kernel is given by the, uh, by the, uh, I mean, by the nature. I do not know the reward function. So, so therefore, I need to collect the data, right? So I collect the data. I learn this operator. So in other words, the conditional expectation I have here, I'll be learned through the regression function. Uh, so I learned this. I got a, a, a learning the queue, right? And with the learn the queue, I just keep iterating this every time using sampling and learning. And this is really the deep reinforced learning I'm going to talk today. Uh, so the an early algorithm on this is really, I mean, is like it's a sample version of this is docker approximation to solve this uh, Bellman, uh, I mean, optimality equations. Uh, so in which is really a stochastic, uh, I mean, uh, equation. So since I'm not going to emphasize a lot of this, uh, so let me not try to explain this because we have a lot of other things to talk. But basically saying is, right, so this step is, the, is equal to the current value, right, plus uh, ADA and then plus the newly learned value from your collected data. So the difference between this is really like a temporal difference or people sometimes call TD uh, algorithm. But I, but let me just not get into this. So this is really uh, is a, a very early version on asynchronized version of doing uh, this. Now, the, uh, and this is usually applied to tabular case. So in other words, the state space is uh, discrete, right? So if we apply to tabular space to the complex ob object like image, right? So that would be certainly a humongous amount of states. Uh, and uh, so because of this, Right, so we approximate uh, the value function. If there's a state and action function right, uh, by a deep neural network. And the deep neural network is, is really to apply the like image. There's a lot of states by using this, uh, I mean, deep, uh, deep reinforcement learning. And there's lots of uh, prior work uh, on this, either on the tabular case or on function approximation case and the statistics and econometrics. Uh, the community also contribute a lot to like the Q learning, uh, dynamic treatment regions, policy op optimization, personalized treatment, and so on. So, uh, I mean, there's no uh, nearly impossible for me to exhaust all those literature, but there's a huge literature on this kind of work. So now, uh, now I introduce a bit about uh, the uh, the deep learning. I mean, sorry, the uh, reinforcement learning uh, framework. 
uh, or that our Marco decision processes. So now let me also take a few minutes on of introducing the deep neural networks. Right? So uh, the deep neural network in nutshell uh, is like the, I mean, function approximation by, I mean, a, a kind of function like this, right? So it's a composition. So econometrician statisticians know very well. So if you give me an image or give me many uh, high dimensional outputs, the first thing that what we do, just like stock market, what we do is creating indexes, right? Creating index means you take linear combination of your input uh, variables, right? So you do linear combination uh, from let's say, uh, let's say uh, 1000, maybe to 2000 or could be to, to 500, right? So this would be create linear, uh, linear combination. And now you apply non-linear uh, gating to it, right? So this would be uh, become like a value here from three points you could, uh, get into uh, to this many points, right? Now you apply linear transform to this output again, right? So linear transform to so this output again, and then do nonlinear gating and keep doing this, right? And then this L uh, is the hidden layer here is called depth, right? And uh, I mean, the input dimension is, let's say, assume it's R, uh, the next dimension would be D1, right? And DL and so on. So it could be, uh, so this is the, the uh, neural net. Right. Uh, and I denote uh, the uh, Relu neural networks, uh, and I assume the spots in here. So the parameter in this uh, neural network is WL, right, and this BL. So, uh, so therefore, I uh, using WL tilde to be, denotes the linear combination of uh, of x. Right. So this is the W tilde. So uh, I uh, so I use a sparse relu neural network to represent in function looks like this, uh, with first maximum weights is bounded by one, but the, uh, and second the total non-zero elements in these weights is by by sum let's say s, and this is the where the sparsity uh, coming from, right? And the the, uh, the maximum function bound by v. And then of course, it depending on the width uh, that you have in uh, in between. So this is the uh, deep uh, neural net networks. And uh, what is good about this uh, deep neural network, uh, at least uh, one of important statistical contribution is adaptive learning. So let me explain what I mean by adaptive learning. Right? So let's say GJ function is from uh, PJ dimensional function. Uh, map into uh, PJ plus one, right? I mean, PJ plus one dimensional uh, vector uh, here. So in other words, uh, let's say from three dimensional function to let's say 10 dimensional uh, function here, but each of those have only three dimension here. Right? Uh, now I assume each component is uh, uh, beta J holder smooth uh, with a most TJ variance. Okay, so in other words, uh, uh, so each of these uh, GJK has a low dimensional structure that satisfies some kind of uh, uh, like uh, uh, intrinsic uh, dimensionality is uh, GJ, right? So now I, uh, I denote uh, my function uh, to be a composite of all these kind of low dimensional functions. So give me an, exa give you an example, right? So my F function could be uh, five dimensional that as I write here consists of the first dimension, right? And this is the second one function. This is the third function. Right? So if you look at this, right? So it's a composition composition of many functions. Some of those is only uh, has only intrinsic dimension two, but some have only intrinsic dimension one. So the total function here is really have uh, intrinsic dimension. Uh, I mean, uh, two in this uh, particular uh, example. So now, given a, a function that has a composite, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, composition of many low dimensional function, can neural network automatically adapt you to such a kind of uh, function estimation from statistical non parametric estimation point of view? Uh, and the answer is uh, is yes. So let me denote, right? So if you are talking about F like this, right? So uh, the smooth degree of smoothness, of course, depending on the uh, first J component of this, right? So it's starting from here and uh, up to here, right? So it is like a bottleneck, right? So now it depends on how smooth in my GJ function here is, and then plus the smoothness of the one before them, right? So, uh, so let me denote the smoothness of beta J is this degree of smoothness, or the degree of smoothness of this GJ, plus 
right, whatever the bottleneck there is, if beta L is big enough, that would be just B, uh, beta J itself, right? So this is the, 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 the smoothness of a part of function up to here. And let me call this uh, FJ, okay. <clears throat> So here is the, uh, I mean, a nice result published in uh, Annals of Statistics as uh, 2000, uh, in 2020 by Schmidt Heber. Uh, so he basically is saying that uh, for any R dimensional, uh, I mean, Lipschitz function uh, with degree of freedom, so with a degree of smoothness beta. Uh, so there exists a ReLU network, uh, sparse ReLU network. Uh, that actually have approximation error uh, in infinity norm bounded by something like this. So this is really very similar to the uh, to the uh, non-parametric uh, case, and in which m is the I mean proportional to the depth, and l is n is proportional to the width. So uh, so the more concrete uh, expression is a little bit complicated here. So let me not get to here, but I think this I think will appreciate better. So if I find uh, the least square estimator in my sparse ReLU network with some kind of up to some kind of optimization position. And uh, uh, so if I set uh, the alpha star uh, to be like a two beta j divided by this, but so this for most people who do non-parametric know that this is the uh, optimal rate of convergence if you have right intrinsic dimension is beta j. Right, uh, I'm sorry, intrinsic smoothness is beta, degree of smoothness is beta j, and intrinsic dimensionality is beta, bj. Right? So this is basically say the hardest, uh, I mean, rate of convergence in the composition that I was telling you uh, moments ago. Then, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Schmidt and Heber basically showed that uh, the optimal rate of convergence uh, would, be, uh, would be of this order. Right? So in other words, uh, so, uh, I mean, there are certain conditions that uh, relate to that, uh, but basically what it really says is uh, if you use ReLU neural network, uh, it will adapt to unknown low dimensional structure of F. So in other words, for giving you an example like this, even though I do not know that my function was composition of, uh, of like a, it's a five dimensional function composition like this, I do not know this, uh, the, con uh, the structure, but the neural network will automatically find a sparse, uh, I mean, solution such that the rate of convergence will be adapted automatically to the optimal rates for this problem, which is really non-parametric rates for two dimensions. Right? So in other words, in the example I show you here, this TJ will be two, uh, will be two there. So, uh, so in other words, so this is uh, one, I think very nice results. That's the, this is con contribution, if you, have unknown to you, if your uh, high dimensional function happen to be additive, then we basically say the intrinsic rates, neural network will be automatic give you one dimensional rates. If it is, let's say, consists of all bivariate uh, interaction models, so then basically saying that neural network will give you uh, two dimensional uh, rates, right? And then later, at about the same time, Michael Kohler and his collaborators also have a bunch of uh, nice uh, results on hierarchical interaction models and uh, uh, without really putting like a sparsity of the neural networks and the showing that uh, uh, similar adaptive or more general adaptive kind of uh, rates of convergence uh, continue to uh, hold. Now let's uh, go to the, the part I really want to show you the result is on deep uh, Q learning. So again, as I said, you could imagine that you are in, a, uh, you have let's say an image, which is let's say 1024 times 1024. There will be a lot of states, right, for this kind of things. Uh, so the, uh, the deep Q learning is really trying to extract the feature from the image, right, and then give uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, and then uh, by using the uh, deep neural networks and then regard it uh, as a, like a, a tabulate uh, case, but all these kind of learning is adaptive learning in, in that. And the very successful example, and I think make a, a big uh, uh, splash is deep Q learning in this uh, Ming at home, uh, 2015. So the, the title of the, uh, the paper basically saying human level control right through uh, deep reinforcement learning 
in this paper, they report like among 49 games, right? So uh, the machine could beat 29 times of the experts uh, in, in terms of playing uh, all those uh, 49 games. And what is the, uh, and what is the uh, uh, essential, I mean, the trick uh, uh, in doing, uh, I mean, it make this a success, right? So you could, uh, and uh, the deep Q learning adapt two tricks. Uh, the first trick is that, uh, I mean, through the past experience, right? So let's say I restore the last 1 million games, right? So last 1 million games is that when I see this state, I see the action, I got the reward function R, and then I know where the state transition to, right? And this is uh, about 1 million. And then I do subsampling, right? because otherwise all those sequences are too highly correlated. I do subsampling, let's say I sample uh, 10,000 of them. Right? So, so in other words, I really make it like an IID sample from this, like an independent sample. Right? And at the same time, uh, they create what so called uh, a separate uh, new network, uh, new network, or they call target network, uh, to approximate the targets. And uh, what they do is given, let's say, the current belief or current learning of the Q function uh, through the neural network. Uh, so you create uh, the the new Y function, right? Because this Q is given to you, the gain is given to you, right? So this is uh, so you you create this new Y uh, like this, and uh, what is this why you created, it looks very strange, right? But if you take conditional expectation of this, so it's really just equal to what we defined before called the Bellman uh, operator. So, uh, so if you create Y looks like this, uh, then the expected value of this Y indeed is equal to a Bellman operator. So therefore, if you want to learn how Bellman operator operate on the current network, you really need just to do a, run a regression problem. So if I collect 10,000 data or, or uh, 10,000 data from this, this subsample, so I just run least squares, right? So this is my YI is my created data, uh, which whose expectation is the target I want. And now I just do the least square use, using the real network, and I got this uh, theta hat. Of course, of course, it will not going to minimize this non convex function. They will be applied like the gradient updates, and they show that using the same uh, the same hyperparameter, the same architects, uh, that uh, the deep Q learning actually could beat like a twenty nine out of forty nine of, of those uh, games. And uh, so in order to understand the theoretical property of this, so we idealize a little bit. So in order to make uh, theory being able to uh, study, right? So, uh, so let's say, so I sample my data XI, uh, SI and AI, SI is my current state, AI is from uh, this, uh, from a certain kind of distribution, this distribution, any distribution, it could be say a random, right? So then I collect it, because just like I is a generative model, I, I have my state, I have my action, so therefore I can observe my reward and I can see where the state transits to. I do this n times, like it's called batch, right? So now I create my YI the same way like the, what DP, uh, Q learning were creating. So this is uh, the AI that I created based on my observed data and the, the current network, right? So let's say it's starting from initial value. Now currently I'm in, uh, in QK. So I, I, I'm in QK, so I calculate this YI, right? So, uh, and then, as I said moments ago, conditional expectation of this, by definition, is equal to, uh, right, your uh, Bellman operator operate on this uh, current QK. So therefore, you just need to update by applying the least square estimator. So if I really systematically illustrate this by graph. So what is in population level? Population level, if you starting from any initial action value function, apply Bellman operator, right? And then you get into TQ zero, you apply Bellman operator again, and you apply many times, then we say by, by fixed point theorem, you have to be converged linearly to, uh, to the uh, fixed point, the optimal value. Now, uh, in reality, this T is unknown to you, right? Bellman operator is unknown to you, but we, we subsample and data points. And now we learn 
uh, this right through uh, statistical uh, neural network regression. So uh, from this Q0, so you apply your learned or estimated Bellman operator, you get to this T1. Now, the, uh, now you have you get to this Q1, not uh, Q1, right? So, and now you collecting data again, uh, and data again, you apply the this regression again. You so as acting as you learn the uh, Bellman operator, you get T2 uh, and so on. Right? So this is really the uh, Q network, what we are doing. So instead of running this population version where you keep iterate Bellman operator, uh, in each of these settings, you starting from one Q, uh, you collecting data, you do regression, you update your Q, you uh, so as if you up apply Bellman operator once, right? So you starting for the new Q, you collect the data again, uh, you uh, run the regression again, so you learn the new Q, right, and so on. So it, it's really, uh, this is a sample version that apply to in the uh, deep uh, new, uh, neural networks, and this is the, uh, the population uh, version. Okay, now the question, of course, naturally asked is, what is the statistical rate of convergence? And the, what is the algorithmic rate of convergence? And how about if I apply a similar thing to uh, zero-sum game? So um, there are certainly a few challenges that we need to address. So first is how to analyze the neural network regression error propagate through the reinforcement learning, uh, I mean, process, right? Remember the error starting from here, there's Q1 had contained the error here, uh, error, uh, the error in learning here, you have an error here, that would be accumulated or error in this twice and so on. So there's, a, there's an error accumulation issues there too. Uh, uh, and so on. <clears throat> so uh, here is just quickly summarize what the result we got. So I assume for simplicity, the state is R dimensional and A is a finite, a finite uh, sample. And we assume that the, the dispute, sample and distribution that you have is regular, meaning that all the state being explored. And that we focus on the sparse ReLU neural network uh, and, and, and so on. And then we evaluate uh, the the error, right? So the, if I stop my algorithm, just like learning and then uh, learning, uh, so, so it started from Q0, I collect in data, I do regression, it's a learning, right? So I get in, uh, I, I get in uh, Q1, right? Learning and decision, learning and decision. Uh, so I, uh, I optimize this by uh, the L1 error between these two. So under some kind of complicated conditions, so let me not get to it, not that complicated, but just let me get to it. So basically saying that the, the error that we got through this deep Q learning algorithm, uh, that is each time starting from initial value, you collecting data, you getting an updated Q, right? So this through the, this is really apply like estimated bell plan operator once, and then you collecting data and do this again, right? So if you do this K times, so the algorithm convergence certainly converge like linearly in this, and statistical rate of convergence depending on uh, the yeah, I mean the unknown nature of your uh, Q value function, and this is really depending on how I mean uh, the degree of smooth the worst scenario a degree of smoothness and times the uh, the uh, the action uh, space uh, the how size of the action uh, space you have so this is really the optimal rate for beta i mean whole I mean composite uh, beta holder uh, smoothness so uh, so in summary uh, what we really get is this right so uh, if you uh, run k sufficiently large because it's linearly converged right so in, in a logarithmic order is enough uh, then you achieve the rate of convergence like this for, I mean, your, I mean, the, uh, the Q, uh, Q learning. So let me remind again. So if you are in the population version, you just apply Bellman operator many times, you get into your optimal Q. Now in reality, I don't really have that one. So I start in initial value, I collect in data and I do regression to learn this T1 operator, I got this, but right? I do regression to get the T2 operator, I got this. And we say, this is the this whole learning and decision operator will have rates of convergence uh, like what we have uh, here. So this is uh, the, the rates of convergence on deep Q learning. And then uh, let me just say a few lines of proof. I know it's pretty uh, late and pretty difficult for people to digest all those notations, lots of notation here. But basically, as I said, our learned function is the iterative application of 
studies will learn the Bellman operator, and each studies will learn Bellman operator uh, has um, well approximate to the true Bellman operator if the sample size is large enough, and uh, you can show that uh, the uh, the error in the k step is really just non parametric uh, regression error. This is the, the same. And then uh, if you accumulate those uh, non parametric regression error, you can show it's bounded by the maximum of non parametric uh, regression error plus organic convergence uh, uh, error and so on. And now the regression error, of course, we all know this equal to approximation error plus model complexity. And then the model complexity. Uh, of this kind of uh, model has been studied in the literature. So this is really basically the uh, the idea of the proof uh, is certainly more complicated than what I talk here, but to give you uh, an idea what uh, it uh, uh, it is. Uh, and now let me, I know it's a little bit fast. Uh, let me just also summarize the result that we get from a uh, single, I mean, to multi-agent reinforcement learning. And in this case, we just generalize a little bit uh, that we have two players, right? uh, player A and player uh, uh, player A and B, uh, and then starting from initial values. Right? So you, A and B take, uh, uh, both take an actions from there, I mean, uh, allowable action space. And then you A get an R, uh, reward R0 because zero sum game. So the other one get left R0. Now the system moved to this S1, right? So now you, again, both player taking simultaneously the action. So you get in the, the, uh, the reward R1 and left you R1 for player B uh, and so on. So this is again, S is the state space uh, A, and B are action space of two players, right? And then the reward function, of course, depending on the, uh, the state and, uh, and the action both A and B, uh, I mean, take. And we are here only, uh, I mean, counting player one or player A, right? Uh, and uh, well, the same like a transition kernel is unknown to us, right? And uh, for, I mean, uh, for this zero sum game, uh, I mean, player A and player B trying to find their op optimal policy to uh, to optimize their game. And this minimax game, uh, so certainly you can define similarly uh, value action value function. This will be a discounted, uh, uh, I mean, action value function as what we've seen uh, before, except now I have two actions being taken by player one and player two. Uh, uh, two and the player two is trying to minimize player one's uh, I mean profit right and player one trying to maximize its profit so this is uh, the uh, the minimax uh, optimality uh, issues and uh, they exist such a kind of uh, minimax uh, equilibrium and then the same like what we had before uh, the minimax uh, the optimal Q uh, I mean function is when you plug in both optimal policy at that uh, equilibrium. And then also you define uh, similarly like Bellman operator. So the only difference here we had before here is that we just take the maximum value of the Q function because it's only you need a, a greedy policy. Now the greedy policy problem, you have to solve uh, this like a minimax uh, game within the uh, the tabular uh, situation. So this is what we call uh, one step uh, uh, solution uh, here. And then the algorithm is pretty similar to what we had before. Uh, so we assuming again, generative uh, model. So you collecting data, right? S uh, and action A and action a, a B uh, from certain distribution, you observe what is the reward function. You observe how the system transmit. Now you calculate uh, similarly the, uh, the y, uh, y function, the, uh, the value Y, and then you run regression uh, to learn what is the Bellman operator. And, uh, and, and then, uh, then you just, uh, uh, then at the end, you just output uh, your uh, uh, policy. So uh, we could similarly show like the results uh, like this. So this is the, uh, uh, if you apply the iterate uh, deep Q uh, fixed uh, Q um, iterative Q network, so you get in like the results similar to what we had before. This is depending on how big 
the actual space of A and B is, and this is the right. I mean the optimal uh, learning rates uh, during the I mean a neural network approximation, and this is the uh, optimization error. Okay, so this is uh, pretty much I want to say, but let me just quickly summarize what I ha have said. Right, so uh, replacing online uh, temporal difference update by offline regression. Uh, deep Q learning, uh, learn optimal policy in uh, reinforcement learning and the Nash equilibrium in zero uh, sun stock head game. And uh, the error of deep Q learning converges uh, linearly to uh, certain statistical errors. Right? So in other words, optimization converges uh, linear to certain uh, uh, statistical errors. And statistical errors certainly depend on interplay of function classes. Uh, the neural networks, as well as uh, the sampling distribution, how you sample, uh, and the deep Q networks adapt to unknown structure of Q star. So if Q star essentially is low dimensional, then you adapt to unknown structure of this Q star, and uh, uh, in that sense is uh, statistically uh, optimal. Uh, I know it's a very, very technical talk for the new year. So sorry for the technicality, but uh, uh, so there's a, a paper that we are currently revising uh, is on the archive, right? so a theoretical analysis of deep Q learning. So with this note, uh, let me thank you exactly at 50 minutes. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, Jan Jin, thank you very much for a very nice, interesting, interesting talk about uh, uh, deep Q learning and its uh, statistical properties. So, I well, I understand that uh, uh, this uh, we now uh, go move to the um, Q and A session, and I think this is chaired by. Uh, um, um, who is going to chair it? Yeah, Professor uh, Chi Fong. Ah, uh, Chi Fong. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, from NTU, uh, could you uh, take over my uh, position? Okay, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Professor Fan, for giving us such an inspiring talk. Uh, thanks for Chinfen and Professor Nishiyama uh, for inviting uh, Professor Fan. And uh, we NTU Economics is very honored to be part of this uh, TED uh, uh, talk. Yeah, uh, now it's a Q&A uh, session. We noticed that there are nearly 300 participants in this talk, and we have a very, di uh, a very diversified audience. Please, yeah, if you have any questions for Professor Fan. I see there's a chat here. Uh, what does the gamma pattern mean in the Q function? Okay, yeah, sorry, I didn't read that one before, but that, uh, yeah, that was from Xiao Xuan Yuli. Right, so gamma is really, uh, I mean, technically speaking, is a, a user's defined discounting factor. Right? So we usually thinking that the discounting is, uh, is very slow, very small, so that the uh, gamma is something close to one, but not quite one. So in other words, in many asymptotic studies, uh, in all those either tabulate or, uh, or I mean, uh, function approximation case, we're thinking gamma uh, go to one, right? So if you don't like gamma, then the problem getting more complicated. That would be called finite horizon, uh, uh, I mean, episodic, uh, I mean, deep neural nets. Uh, there are a lot of study too. The notation will be far more complex than I, I even uh, introduced here today. Yeah, but gamma basically in the, in the learning there is given, is a user given discount factor. Okay, uh, Professor Feng Yang, yeah. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, thanks for the uh, very inspiring talk. I learned a lot. Uh, I just have a question about the, um, uh, uh, so when we, uh, I know, I don't, I guess maybe I didn't catch it about uh, the assumptions for uh, learning this space. So because uh, when we, for example, when we play a game, right? Uh, and then all the actions are dependent. And um, so, so when we, even if we like uh, sampling the uh, like sub, sub space, uh, sub steps, for example, it's it's also it's still not independent, right? Uh, I'm I'm just wondering, like in the learning theory, uh, is there this assumption about independence, or like we don't need this? Uh, we can allow like weak dependency about the samples. Uh, yeah, this is a 
uh, uh, indeed very good question, right? So uh, luckily many of us are econometricians, right? So, uh, so first of all, of course, that when we like uh, uh, this, the real algorithm being used uh, in the uh, in the deep uh, Q learning, they do subsampling, like if you, I subsample, uh, let's say 1%, right? So data are, well, weakly correlated, much weaker than you just do Markovian uh, sample, right? Uh, so the, uh, yeah, so the extension, there are very few uh, ex uh, extensions so far. I mean, very limited theory. I mean, extending D theory to, let's say, to mixing uh, processes or like uh, uh, Markov processes with, uh, uh, with, let's say, spectral gap or something like that. So relatively few results on, on that, but there's a, but Technically, it's possible uh, to let's say generate the data from IID um, IID generative model to a kind of weak, uh, I mean, mixing process. I think is uh, is possible. It's just um, uh, I I don't know whether people have done that on let's let's say in the in the context of deep learning. I do not know that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let, let me see if. Uh, oh, I sorry. Uh, the Tracy has a question. I was about to ask Tracy. The, in our paper, did we did study weak dependence? Um. Uh, no, I. I, I, I don't... We still do not. We still do not assume mixing, right? So we still assume. We, we still do not do not. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Because I was thinking you're raising question for that. No, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, Professor, thanks for this wonderful talk. Uh, yeah, I, I can imagine how technical the proof is, but the, but you explain the ideas very clearly. I, I really learned a lot. Um, my question is about the assumption that the Q function uh, has a low intrinsic dimension. I'm just wondering, uh, what does this assumption imply for the uh, bulk of decision process and the reward functions? So, so basically my question is that if I know some properties of the uh, Markov uh, transition kernel and some properties of the reward function, then how do I know whether or not the, the, the resulting Q function has an intrinsic low dimension or not? Yeah, uh, <laughs> this indeed a very, uh, a very, uh, I mean, good question, right? So uh, of course, if my, my Markov transition kernel itself has a low dimensional structure. I believe right? uh, it can be entailed the low dimensional structure on, on, the, uh, on the Q function. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, I was thinking just the, I mean, I was thinking of the opposite, right? So uh, I was thinking say, hey, uh, since is the, since is like an automatic adaptive to low dimensional, if there's a low dimensional structure, the deep mm -hmm. neural network will explore it. If there's no deep, uh, if there's no low dimensional structure, then the neural network uh, still give you not a slow rate, but still optimal, right? So, uh, so in other words, it still work now. And and this uh, and now now of course we can say the the other way. So the neural network has been empirical so many so much successes. So this must be entail the theoretical network in the real world is also low dimensional. That the only thing I, I can see. think of uh, answer your philosophy. Interesting, but also interesting question, but also philosophical question too. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah. Zhenjing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think I saw your hands raised. Oh no, I cannot hear you. When you raise the hand first, yeah. Uh, please, Professor, please. Uh, the John Chen Jun, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, my question uh, may be very naive. Like, uh, I have two questions. One is like, um, this zero sum uh, stochastic op like optimization, talking about uh, optimal policy. Uh, maybe it depends on how long the game will run. And uh, if we can figure out uh, eventually benefit to uh, player A or player B, uh, what kind of reward function we will have? This will be decided how do we uh, talk about this optimal policy, right? This right. is my first question. 
Okay, yeah. So uh, again, this very uh, good question. So let me say that, I mean, there must be way more people on the audience know about game theory than me. Right? So you know that I'm not really uh, in the game uh, theory, but, uh, uh, but uh, the, yeah, I mean, the way we study is really the infinite horizon. Right? So again, infinite horizon and finite horizon is different. Uh, yeah, we are uh, adding a, a discount thinking they are a key plane uh, these uh, uh, soccer uh, games, and then we assume in uh, in this like zero sum game, we assume in the uh, again the, uh, the 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 function is unknown. So the r uh, mm -hmm. the the reward is unknown to you, uh, and the, I. I think the learning is the same. So when you learn R, I learn R because the information given to us is the, the same as we all play. So I think it's, it's still a, uh, how to say that, a fair game in the okay. process. Good. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my second question, uh, this is like a, when you're talking about first part, the DN uh, do this sparsity for every layer. Uh, for sparsity, my understanding is uh, it is equivalent to how many of the predictors uh, we are going to select. So at uh, every layer, maybe we select a different sparsity or different uh, those uh, X or predictors. Then if we combine everything, eventually will be larger. If we have um, the also layer is also growing. Yeah. Yeah, actually, this is when the paper is published in the Annals of Statistics. There's a lot of criticism on the sparsity constraint here, as you what you uh, what you uh, as what you uh, said uh, 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 here. So here is really constrained on total number of sparsity, and uh, this algorithm, as we know, the L zero in sparse regression or best subset selection already difficult, right? So in the neural network, if you ask me to do uh, nearly optimal. Uh, solution that minimize these targets, uh, right? So this is nearly uh, impossible. So this is really, a, uh, I mean, it's hard for L0 in ordinary regression, there's certain way harder in this neural network. So it's really only a theoretical results. And uh, admittedly, there's always a gap between theory and application. So in the, in the success, a successful, uh, I mean, the deep Q learning, right? So people use uh, the, or in the, 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 the people use stock gradients. Uh, and there's limited understanding whether the gradient methods ever converge to anything that we want, right? So, uh, so there's certainly some gap there. It's just ideal statistical study without taking optimization error into consideration. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Professor Fan, uh, thank you very much for your very insightful talk. I have two questions. Uh, first is uh, regarding the algorithm, uh, how do we choose the initial value for Q02? And uh, the second question is, uh, I want to ask, uh, given the adaptive nature of the neural network, can we think that it's going to be uh, strictly dominant to conventional, uh, for example, non-parametric econometric methods? Thank you very much. Uh, okay, <laughs> uh, very good question. Uh, thank you for the good question. And so, thank you. I did. I will not know in the technology well, so you were raising question question first. But anyway, uh, so the uh, the the first question about initial value of Q zero. Uh, I mean, uh, the practical speaking is certainly important. Right? So the uh, Theoretically, it doesn't matter because it's linear contraction starting from any values. Uh, uh, I think it probably doesn't matter. Probably when people, I, I do not know when, let's say when people run in this Q network, what the initial, theoretically it doesn't matter because starting from any value will converge linearly to, uh, to, the, to the targets. But now for practical of this, uh, what do they do initial Q value? I, really don't know maybe you play a few games and then taking average of those game as initial values uh yeah and that part i don't know sorry for uh, for that now the second part you're asking a very interesting question right so the uh should we replace the uh i mean statistical technique by neural net i would say not yet right I, I mean for many 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 reasons right? I know that there's a, a adaptive here but this adaptive learning uh, the 
right? We first of all, we are all talking about um, rate of convergence uh, without really taking much care of, uh, I mean, of constant and so on. If you're looking at some of those constants, uh, they are huge constant. I do not know what those kind of constant really entail in terms of rates, right? Uh, and then uh, secondary, I mean, the traditional econometric model tend to assuming that I have already have some structures. And then uh, with assume the structure, I learn myself, certainly it's better than machine, I mean, automatic learn structure, even though the rate, I say, play a log, logarithm order plus constant, but the, the practical speaking, I think still have quite a dif uh, different. Having said that, um, Whenever I apply, let's say, neural net, I, I do a lot of empirical work during those two pandemic uh, years. So uh, if I really don't have a very good prior knowledge, uh, then I will use, tend to use uh, neural net. But many times I tend also like to use econometric model, let's say using factor augmented uh, regression model factor augmented uh, because it's something like what we are talking here, right? So in particular, for example, when we talk about image uh, and when we do like uh, the smoothing of the image, so uh, all those like uh, uh, input features are highly correlated. So I would rather do like a factor model first to separate common dependent and that so 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 in other words so the all these neural networks assumption is based on ideal assumption i think it's good to understand what their success or ge generic model like image and so on where i do not know really what the function value or q value function looks like then i think neural networks are reasonable but in economic studies maybe we have lots of prior knowledge about the economic relationship and the uh, usual relationship doesn't that far away from linear. I might use small structured and econometric model to solve these problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Fan, there's uh, uh, a message in the chat box. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. So there is a relation with non parametric estimation as you can reach non parametric error bounds. Okay, yeah. So uh, this is, uh, I mean, a very uh, good question. Right? So the, the question is, there's a relation with non parametric regression. Uh, uh, indeed, I mean, the neural networks uh, in many ways being regarded as a kind of, uh, I mean, I'm always regarded as a kind of scalable non parametric So when you apply to multiple dimension, let's say five dimension uh, or, or more, uh, or way more, uh, that, uh, yeah, I mean, traditional, let's say, basis or feature based usually will suffer because of dimensionality implementation. The nice part of neural network, again, neural network is not because neural network itself is because of architect of neural network. I always think neural network consists of more than one component. It consists of many other components too, right? Optimization trick, uh, stock app gradients, and, uh, and all those kinds of things is being regarded as all neural network. So in the implementation, uh, neural network usually doesn't suffer with uh, curse of dimensionality because they implement that way, starting from initial randomization, doing a little bit uh, local optimization or that. So, it, so, so I always regard it as a non parametric method, but just scalable, right? So if you give me, let's say, uh, uh, let's say if you give me tensor uh, uh, splines, uh, then I certainly have curse of dimensionality issues in implementation. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so there's certainly a, a good relation between uh, the, uh, I mean, between non parametric regression and that. And then the, the next question is asking how to deal with the problem when error is correlated with state and actions. Yeah, then indeed, uh, this is just like, uh, yeah, indeed, uh, there are some difficulty that you need to, uh, to deal with, but similar to non parametric regression, right? So if you do not assume homoscedasticity, so error is always related with, uh, right, relate with your covariance X. Uh, and so long as the like a conditional martingale structure or conditional uh, independent structure uh, exists, I think the error 
uh, will be average out? I think that's uh, the question for like assuming how. Uh, yeah, I think the, but other than that, I cannot really say much more than the fact that uh, when we do non parametric regression with heteroscedasticity, uh, we are already dealing with this kind of like a dependence between error and, uh, and the state X. Thank you, uh, Shiming. Uh, let's see. Yeah, any other questions for Professor Feng? Yeah, uh, uh, Professor Chifeng, I think we can go to the time for free talk. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So free talk means everybody can talk whatever they like, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, uh, Qin Feng, and thank you, uh, Qi Feng, for I mean chairing the session. So now it's free talk. Let me say happy New Year to all of you again. Um, yeah. So sorry, it's a little bit technical talk. I know that was not chosen by me, but uh, good. <laughs> Um, may I ask a question? Yeah, a, a very simple question. Yeah. Uh, is it easy to uh, enter Princeton University as a student? And I also want to ask Prof Professor Fang, uh, how many PhD students and uh, how many postdoctoral uh, students do you, do you have? Currently? Yeah, sorry, yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm asking. Oh, my department. <laughs> You yeah, know, yeah. maybe we can stop recording first and then we can do the free talk. Maybe it's better. Pardon? You can stop recording. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I, I can also stop the, 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 the sharing so then people can yeah, see. Yeah, more. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Attitude. yeah, thank you. Yeah. Let me see. Good. Yeah. No. yeah and now uh, I can see more people. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to know, uh, is it easy to enter Princeton University as a student? Uh, yeah, I mean, all good students should be easy to come. Among people on the screen, many of them are Princeton students. I can see at least four or five are from Princeton. So if you ask them, they must be say easy, right? Uh, am, am I correct? There are two curves there. <laughs> yeah. I, I... I wouldn't call it easy, but uh, yeah, it's a great experience. Yeah, if it, uh, there is a chance, maybe I will try again. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the uh, admission committee of our department. Uh, uh, like we, we lost uh, students to Princeton every year. Like we tried to convince them to uh, select our offer, but a lot of them chose to go to Princeton. Oh, really? We are lucky. Oh, by the way, I mean, uh, Ke, uh, Tracy Ke is currently at Harvard. So she, she was one person admitted by Harvard, but came to Princeton too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we, we admit quite a number of people. And I think the good thing of uh, the university and the, the department here is that we all have very good students. And the good student really pushed my research in a very complete orthogonal directions. And then students learn each other. I think the, the important, probably the most important thing is probably the environment here that actually, yeah, quite inspiring. Hello, Professor Kato. Yeah. Hi. I can, cannot hear Hi, happy you. New Year. Do you have some question? Yeah. Uh, no, just, just join. <laughs> Yeah, Sorry. great to see you, Kendall. Yeah, yeah nice yeah. to see you again. Kendall. Thank you. Uh, Professor Fan, may maybe I have uh, just a more uh, application-oriented question. Mm -hmm. I mean, after uh, after this deep neural network was applied in the, you know, the AlphaGo kind of uh, uh, and all these kind of chess playing uh, situations, has there been a lot of uh, other types of uh, applications in recent years for deep queue learning in you know other fields of uh, yeah, whichever fields it is? Yeah, great, great question. Right? So I mean, this D mine is really amazing. Right? So in December, November, December, 2020, right? uh, I think they have like an alpha fold. So I know that when I was, 
young, uh, I was learning, trying to learn about our folding.